Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Lifestyle Mastery, and I'm excited to have Luca Cartagini, who's the founder of Shop Circle, the number one provider of e-commerce software. Shop Circle has attracted funding from top tier investors like QD Investors, Six Forty Five Ventures, and Founders Factory. Welcome to the show, Luca. Thanks a lot, Roy. Very nice to talk, and thanks for having me. Awesome. So you know, um, I'm I'm quite intrigued by by your journey. I I I happen to know uh, you know again. Um, but I, I was quite interested to know, you know, what was your experience growing up in in the UK, and you know, how did you come about studying in the uh, in the UK to do your masters? Yeah, I actually did grow. Up. I mean, me personally, as you can probably tell from my accent and my name, I, I'm Italian. Uh, yeah. So I did grow up in Italy, and then I moved in the UK for my master's degree um, ten years ago in a French university called the SCP Business School, but they have a campus in uh, the UK as well. And then I never looked back. So I stayed in the UK ever since uh, for the last 10 years. I developed all my career there. So I worked initially in banking uh, right. for an investment bank called uh, Jefferies, uh, where I was covering uh, internet retail stocks. And then I moved to a uh, family office venture capital fund called Pretios and Ventures, where I was responsible for seed uh, and Series A investments with average check size between 500K and $5 million. Um, yeah, so it was very fun. I was always like, you know, for whatever reason, more exposed to the finance side. And London is a great city, uh, both when it comes to venture capital, banking, but also to start your own company. And so three years ago, I decided to move to the other side. So from providing recommendation, gradually moving towards, you know, investing um, capital in, into tech companies. And then eventually starting my own company. So we started Shop Circle three years ago, together with my co-founder that I've met literally like 10 years ago during the master's degree. Um, and yeah, so we started Shop Circle three years ago, and now it's a very different reality. Yeah, quite interesting. You know, um, so as as I mentioned, you know, I came to the UK, did my did my masters, um, and then I. Uh, I realized that the UK ecosystem is quite vibrant and quite diverse. So you you have a lot of Italians and Spanish founders uh, in the ecosystem. I've had we we talked about Miguel from Gapchase. He's done really well. But why do you think you know there's such a diversity in the UK e ecosystem? And uh, you know, and do did you get that support from other uh, Europeans when you're trying to you know raise funding for for, for shop circle? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're right, uh, Brock. It, it, it does function as a sort of catalyst for European talents. Uh, right. It's almost like, you know, uh, US somehow that attracts people from all over the continents, from South America as well, but really like all over the world from US. But London, particularly in the UK, um, there was an article yesterday that released that even in 2023, despite Brexit and all of that, is still like number one city for amount of capital invested and raised into technology companies uh, by far. And then obviously um, you have Paris, you have Berlin, but um, there is nothing close to London when it comes to uh, tech and finance. Um, and yeah, so there are a lot of talents in Europe, um, especially like in the large countries, like very good school and education system. You mentioned Spain, Italy, France. So yeah, just uh, attracts uh, naturally uh, smart, motivated people. Obviously, starting a business in the UK is much easier as well than in uh, Southern Europe. And I know it because, you know, obviously, it's Shop Circle is an LTD as a holding company, but we do have um, subsidiaries in Spain and Italy as well. And, you know, starting a business, paying taxes, starting a bank account is everything a bit more complex. Um, and obviously, on the other hand, it's also easier to have access to institutional investors from US. Um, and if you think about VC as an asset class, it was really like um, born in, in the West Coast in the US. Um, and that's where most of the capital come from, at least like for large companies. So London as a city gives a lot of visibility um, on American investors. And if I think about our three last round, they were all led by an American investor. So six were actually NFX, uh, QED, and six to five ventures. And obviously being an LTD relatively rather than, you know, um, a Southern European company, uh, it, it helps um, also because, you know, usually when American investors come to Europe, they tend to um, look at London as, you know, sort of like the, the nucleus of all the European best companies.
So it's a mix of factors, really, and I think it's going to stay like this despite Brexit. A lot of people are very pessimistic about London um, and losing talents that were going back to their own countries. It did happen, especially in particular industries such as you know sales and trading, investment banking, which became a bit more fragmented and local. But in the tech space and in the VC space, we haven't seen much so far. Got it. Got it. Interesting. And and you had worked in in Jeffries and and, and produced some ventures. I happen to know Yana, but but what were some of your learnings there? And and does it make sense to you know work uh, in in a VC firm and then start something, or, or work in a, in a corporate and then start something? Or what advice would you give to entrepreneurs in two thousand twenty four? Should they uh, should they start right out of V school? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. So one of the uh, things that they do more as a hobby or hit is teaching entrepreneurship at university. Um, right. And um, and um, obviously the way I do it, the, the the reason why I do it is because you know in Europe you have a bit of a um, a stigma in starting a company straight after university, and everyone goes through the same process after business school. So they go in consulting, they go in investment banking, and then eventually they decide to do something on their own. And I don't blame them. I did exactly the same. But the reason why I did the same was uh, you don't hear real entrepreneurs in, in class. I mean, like you only hear people coming from McKinsey, BCG, Goldman Sachs. And obviously, uh, it's entrepreneurship is, is not that, right? It's like starting your own business without paying yourself a salary. You have to figure out the bills, uh, the first round, the deck, the lawyers. Uh, it's very, very different. So look, uh, I don't think there is a, a size fit whole approach for me. It did really help um, to be like, you know, an investment banking first. You learn a lot. It's a very broad uh, categories as well. And then move to VC was also like very helpful to be very honest. Uh, why? Because you do work with a lot of early stage companies. And so it's a great uh, way to get to work with a lot of early stage companies without actually taking a risk on this company, um, or at, at, at least you personally. And um, yeah, so I would recommend like doing a VC if you want to be an entrepreneur, um, to be very honest, also because you get to see how to talk to investors, what are the challenges that these invest that these entrepreneurs are dealing with every single day. Um, and but also i don't think it's you have to go through that i think you know there are a lot of entrepreneurs especially in the us in europe is happening but a bit less that started out after university or like drop out from you know um mba or bachelor degree and then they started their own company so uh, both ways are possible i think my takeaways is yeah corporate uh working in a corporate or in a consulting firm definitely shape you but if you want to start a company, it's better to do it relatively early rather than late, right? Because, you know, at some point, the commitments uh, are going to be higher. The trade-off is going to be higher because you will make more money in your corporate job. So I think uh, at the age when I started Ship Circle, which was 28, 27, actually, was perfect. Um, I was just at the point where I said, okay, maybe like I won't be able to uh, be so free in terms of like commitments uh, in a number of years. And, but I still have managed to have some experience, like six, seven, eight years of experience before starting it. So that was the right approach for me. Some people might be even more ready before that. Got it. Got it. Super interesting. And and what led to you know starting off a shop circle? I was a fan of Thrasio and you know uh, and what they were building, but uh, but you had an interesting you know start. Um, I you know happened to release a podcast with ali jamal you know who, who syndicated one of the deals but you got some really high quality investors um but what led you to to start with uh shop circle sure so uh look the the proposition roy it is pretty straightforward for us so we wanted to create uh the first operator of e-commerce tools right. which means um the microsoft for any brand selling online the operating system and the problem that e-commerce brands, but, but really everyone uh, is facing at the moment is that there is too many tools, like, you know, there are way too many tools. And um, most of the businesses selling online, particularly on Shopify, where we operate, they used to have five, 10 apps 10 years ago, and now they have 10x that number, right? So the number of applications that they use went up dramatically. 
And we want to solve that problem. Um, and we want to centralize everything under one brand, which is Shop Circle, um, and one onboarding channel as well. So yeah, that, that was our thesis um, to provide brands selling online with everything they need from a product and technology perspective. So we started Shop Circle three years ago with this goal in mind. Um, and now fast forward by three years, we are the largest operator of software in Shopify. We operate approximately 45 products um, and we centralize everything under one brand. So that's that's our uh, proposition and, and what we do. Uh, we only do software. Um, it's a mix of acquisition. We do a lot of m and So we started with a clear goal in mind, Roy, right? um, like uh, three years ago. We realized that the number of applications that the brand selling online were using went up 10 times over the last uh, 10 years. So look, in 2014, 2015, especially in Shopify or in e-commerce in general, most of the brands that are our clients today were using between five and 10 apps. And now this number is between 40 and 50. And they don't want to deal with so many point of contacts and all the complexity with the integration. So we started Shop Circle with the idea of centralizing everything under one brand, one customer service channel, and one partnership channel as well. And um, yeah, fast forward Shop Circle by three years, we have 41 solutions, uh, software solutions spanning from shipping, delivery, supply chain, upselling, cross selling under one brand. Um, and we have a team of uh, 200 people. Uh, all over the world. And you're right, we landed a few um, PC investors, especially from, from the US, where most of our revenue comes from. So 50% of our revenue comes from the US and 10% of our revenue comes from Canada, um, whereas the rest is mostly Europe um, and South America. So yeah, the proposition is really simple. We wanted to create the first operator of e-commerce tool, the Microsoft of e-commerce, basically providing brands with everything they need from a product technology perspective to operate their stores. Got it. Super interesting. And you know, I love the, the Shopify ecosystem, but are you looking to expand out of Shopify or, uh, or, or do you think, you know, Shopify, you would keep expanding to this ecosystem for the next couple of, couple of years? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, a bit confidential, but no, great question. Uh, look, at the moment, we are uh, fully focused on Shopify. We have uh, 40 plus solutions there. And obviously, commerce is, is a huge industry. I wouldn't even call it an industry anymore, right? It's an ecosystem. Yeah. Um, you have trillions, it's a trillions of dollar um, ecosystem because it's, it's about 20% of the retail transactions happening all over the world. Now, imagine how much software you need to power this you know, trillion dollar industry. So, yeah, the starting point is Shopify, which is an amazing ecosystem. You literally have uh, 10,000 um, software solutions in the app stores, which is the real strength of Shopify, in my opinion, the partner ecosystem. So for every dollar that Shopify makes, their partners make seven, six, six or seven times more, including the apps. And there are already four or five unicorn cases that start in the Shopify software um, space, so the app store, and then uh, ended up becoming uh, valued more than $1 billion. Obviously, the most notable case is Clavio, uh, which was the first PC-baked software um, IPO since 2021 after the pandemic, and it's a $8 billion company. But then there are other names such as Recharge, Attentive, Gorgeous, uh, which did very well. So Shopify is an amazing ecosystem to build software, but obviously, as you said, there is more. So never say never. The idea is that you know we serve literally all the commerce brands out there. Amazon is also pretty interesting. So let's see. Got it, got it. Super interesting. And you know, before the call, we we talked about you know revenue-based financing. I've got some great guests like Miguel from Capchase and and the founders on Cap. Uh, but uh, you know, are there any new product developments that are coming out uh, to support other you know e-commerce sellers? Um, yeah, so I guess your question is uh, is around like what other what other companies uh, support e-commerce brands that are interesting for me in the space? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So look, it's uh, I think I mentioned one, which is the most notable success case is Clavio. It's like a um, all-in-one sort of like communication tool with your clients. So mostly like email automation, but not only really. Um, and it's uh, an amazing company. What well, they did extremely well, obviously they were one of the early movers in the Shopify space, but 
eight, nine years ago, if I remember correctly. And then they built this unbelievable partnership ecosystem where you know all the largest agencies in the world um they're specialized on cloud so they also have certification and so they literally build an army of people that, that that do free marketing uh for them uh and the product is 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 crazy right this is very good it's best in class and what they do they have excellent retention um and the way they price and they charge their clients is also like very fair but very smart at the same time so I would say Clavio is uh, an excellent solution for uh, most of the commerce brands out there, especially if you operate on Shopify. Got it. And you know, since the past three years, you know, um, there has been a lot of growth for ShopCircle. But what's been your biggest lesson when it comes to you know master product-led growth? Yeah. So, so it, is it like are you ask me what was the the main driver for growth? Yeah, so I yeah. guess um, look, for us, product is, is very important, right? As long as you obsess over your client's needs and you build a great product based on what they actually communicate to you, and we do have at the moment 7,000 interaction per month with our clients, then the rest follows. Uh, we also do a lot of acquisitions, but obviously what is very important when we do acquire companies is not just acquiring revenue or a piece for the sake of doing it, but we do a very careful due diligence of the product that we get. So, you know, in Shopify, you can check reviews, you can check the code that these apps are built on. Um, you can check what the client says and think, um, doing reference codes as well. And we launch um, a lot of products as well in-house. So um, overall, um, if, if you have a good product and you operate in a space where there is a lot of traffic like Shopify, then usually the organic growth gets there right so you don't even have to pay for ads but people find out about your solutions in the app stores because other people are using it they they rate you very highly and then you rank very highly as well in the app store so there is this uh, very virtuous cycle um and i think products is always the most important thing that it's a matter of like marketing putting it together well partnerships so it's a mix of all the above um and obviously we do m a so I think it was a combination. I wouldn't say that there is like a single secret sauce, right? It's a combination of a lot of factors. I guess building in an app store of a market, you know, in a marketplace of apps uh, like you know Shopify, but you also have Salesforce, you also have Atlassian. Uh, you can also like build uh, for Amazon. It gives you access to a lot of clients for a uh, relatively little bit of my right in comparison to the usual VC paid business. So the amount of revenue that we spend on ads is very low because most of the traffic comes organically from the app store. But obviously that only happens if you have a great product, you get amazing reviews um, and, and people actually install the product after the first free trial. So yeah, it's, it's pure product led growth usually uh, in marketplaces like for apps like Shopify app store got an interesting and you made an interesting point about m a so how do you you know we've had close to around 14 acquisitions um in the last three years how do you look at you know m a and uh, is it a conscious uh, uh you know fact to look at acquiring number of tools in a, in a particular quarter uh, can you walk through you know what's the what's the strategy yeah look it's it's very straightforward right? we have um a product roadmap so we have our current product suite, which is a combination of 40 tools. And we know that we want to be the first operator of e-commerce software, right? So solve most of the problems and the needs that our clients have. So we have a product roadmap based on our assessment on the market and what, what are the main issues that our clients are facing every day. Um, and so acquisition help us in addition to, you know, creating some of these up from scratch to go from where we are, the current product suite, to the product roadmap, right? So, um, yeah, we constantly screen the markets. Uh, we receive a lot of inbounds because most of the players in the App Store, they, they know about us. And obviously, if you're looking for liquidity solutions as a NAP founder in the Shopify App Store, there are not many options. So we receive a lot of inbounds. And we know what are the spaces that we're interested in. So opportunistically, we do make some acquisition if it makes sense in terms of getting us from where we are now to where we want to be and yeah that's that's what we do so far with it 
about 10 acquisitions, all of them well integrated with uh, uh, with our whole platform of food circle. The founder usually has a lot of freedom in terms of like staying or leaving. Um, and yeah, it's working very well for us. Got it, interesting. And and when it comes to uh, you know building a team, you know what's what's been the clearest sign of an outperformer, and and what is what are the signs of lack of performance uh, in uh, in the team, especially because you know shop circle started uh, around the time of COVID. Yeah, exactly. So uh, over performance, yeah, you you you, you need people uh, that go the extra mile, right? At the big so we focus a lot on building a management team which was already like good enough for a later stage company so our cfo comes from um from from show sorry from uh, um, years and years in investment banking our cpo at the time stefan used to come from shopify um our chief revenue officer started like four businesses before so we wanted to uh, surround ourselves with our client at the very beginning and that means that you need to give away some equity sometimes but then, um, yeah, with time, uh, you realize that not everyone can be like this, um, right? So, uh, and, and that's totally fine. You don't need to have people like working as much as you do uh, all the time, like, you know, these 12 plus hours every day, because the incentives are also different. Um, but in terms of like overperformance and underperformance, it's just when you grow so much, you know, and you go like in our case from zero to 200 people in just three years, you will eventually, even if you're the best at choosing and hiring people, you will eventually have cases where you get it wrong. Um, and we did get it wrong uh, in a number of times so far. But let's say we, we got it right way more than we got it wrong. And um, yeah, I think, look, remote doesn't help in uh, selecting uh, the best talents working together with them, because sometimes if you're in the middle of somewhere with different time zone, as well and you don't get to communicate with your team on a daily basis uh it's very tricky um and you know it can create this engagement uh, uh in the in the team members and so now we're trying to hire more and more in in house and um asking people to come to the office a bit more regularly um and usually like you know they they like it they prefer working from the office whenever there is a possibility to do so rather than from home which I think it makes a lot of sense. I've seen a lot of companies that um, you know shifted from the fully remote approach to a hybrid or like full in office approach, and I think it makes a lot of sense because you know collaboration of sitting next to someone, especially for the junior uh, members of the team that never really worked in a company before, it just accelerates everything in terms of like uh, productivity, but also like learning and networking and career opportunities for the different degrees so yeah these um it's very much you know it's been a roller coaster over the last three years so you had several cases of like over performer and under performers the important thing is to align the incentive so if someone deserves more and is performing very well he needs to be able to do well right which means you know have a right incentive structure uh but also like um sort of like facilitate a quick career progression of that person which makes sense because if the company is growing a lot and uh, it's a young company uh early joiners should have um a recognition for that got it no absolutely totally makes makes sense and you know how, how do you look at you know quarterly goals and kpis for your team uh, and you know how should you know, how should a leader look at prioritizing it more effectively yeah, look, I would say at the beginning, um, do not stress too much about KPIs or like at least in terms of financials, hard KPIs, because you probably when you start a business, you know, you haven't found a product market fit, so product mm -hmm. comes first. Uh, then for us, it's a bit different now because it's a large team. We have a lot of clients, a lot of revenue, a lot of profit. So yeah, it becomes more similar to almost like listed entities. You have a board, you set up a plan, every single year and then obviously you track your progress so um yeah uh, here again is a we use a bit of a, a bottom-up approach so we speak with the different departments we sit down with each of them we understand what they can achieve uh for um the rest of the year based on how much we're willing to invest as well in the different areas and then we come up with this budget that we break down into um quarterly 
budgets as well. And for us, it's a bit different, obviously, because we acquire businesses as well. So it takes some time to integrate them. So it adds a bit of complexity. But overall, yeah, it's quite important to put together a strong plan, not too optimistic, and then deliver on that plan, right? Which is something that early stage companies don't do very often. I come from a very traditional background, Rohit. So I'm yeah. research, you know, covering listed entities. And if you are the CEO of the company, you miss the results, the quarterly results, you know, the share price usually uh, goes down quite, quite a bit on the day. Um, and so uh, that stayed with me a bit. So we always try to not um, come up with uh, very unreasonable projections, uh, even though we are early stage. Although, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, you hit, need to hit 100% your number on every single year when you start a company, because reality is that most of the companies don't get also because, you know, if you start a VC big business, your projection will be relatively high. You need to be ambitious. Uh, and especially in a time like this, like 22 and 2021, we've seen a lot of the growth coming down uh, across different markets, including commerce. But overall, we always remain disciplined and not over budgeting, um, not over raising. And that uh, turned out to be very handy now when a lot of like, you know, people and companies that are operating in a similar space, they're struggling just because they did too much too quickly. So it's good to be in the uh, conservatives on the conservative side, even though you are an early stage business. Got it. And uh, and you, you know, you, uh, in the last three years, you know, your your team has significantly grown. But uh, and I read somewhere that like you know, culture always breaks when you know team hits around hundred people. So how do you make sure that you know the culture and values are imbibed in the in the in the team so that once you're growing, you know, the the culture doesn't doesn't break? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Look, uh, it's often like one of these things that you realize as a founder and you don't see it before starting a company. Um, but like, yeah, it's really like you say, when when you don't remember everyone's name, it's kind of like difficult to keep the culture together unless you have a very solid uh, procedure, values, uh, and principle as part of the company. So my recommendation would be to do that as soon as possible. So to, to hire a very good head of HR, um, and because, for instance, myself, I was not an expert when it comes to culture creation and values and principle. Um, and you might think that the whole concept of culture is a bit vague, but actually becomes very relevant uh, once you grow, right? Because you want to make sure that everyone is aligned without having to speak with everyone. And generally, that there is a good culture in the company that helps productivity. And it just feels good to see people happy to work um, um, in your company. So. Yeah, my personal recommendation is hire a head of HR as soon as you can, potentially like after you hit the 20 people milestone rather than, than 50. And um, yeah, make sure that you stick with your values and principle as you grow, uh, because you're right, soon you will you will hope that you did more um, earlier on. Got it. And uh, I also want to talk about growth. You know, what is the, the right ratio of success to failure within growth teams when they're looking at you know experimenting with different marketing and growth strategies yeah it's um it, it obviously we we work on products that now have thousands of reviews you know and there are a lot of positive reviews they've been in the market for a number of years especially the ones that we got from acquisition so and we know what we're doing right we're not uh trying to overlap anymore so we have a very specialized partnership team marketing and growth team, customer service team, and the initiatives that they work on now are very well consolidated initially. But at the same time, we always leave a buffer of capacity of different teams to experiment new things. And um, yeah, we're totally fine with a relatively high degree of failure, right? Uh, if you don't fail enough with new initiatives, it means probably that you're not pushing enough. Um, so we're launching new products all the time we're launching new features all the time we're coming up with different initiatives to reach out the same clients and hopefully like offer more of our products and, and help them more um and so yeah i don't think there is a ratio um it's difficult to quantify exactly how many things go wrong and many things go right because it depends as well on the departments it depends on how big is the product or the feature that you're planning to launch but um 
yeah, I think it's uh, very important for a company at our stage to keep innovating and do not sit on the current functionality because the world is moving so fast that everything that you build, if you don't innovate it, uh, especially in the software space, it will probably be redundant in three or four years. So yeah, yeah um, we always like instill this culture from the very beginning. We, you know, uh, I was a big fan of the book, uh, The Lean Startup. I know that you often ask to your guests uh, about business books and Lean Startup. I think it's a mainstream book, right? Uh, it's, it's not extremely detailed, but it's a very good uh, way to start on, you know, um, innovative innovation overall as part of the company in startup and how to keep it as you grow. Um, so, yeah. Innovation is quite important and not so many people actually invest a lot of time in, in launching new products, but I think then they regret it. So we have a team of about like 100 engineers at the moment, and uh, many of them actually focus on R&D. Karen, super interesting. I you know, quickly want to do the top three. What's your favorite business book? No, oh, exactly. It's uh, one of the, the um, my favorite books is uh, the Lean Startup because it's something very practical. It's written by, you know, uh, operators. So it's really, and it's one of these things that you don't get to learn uh, until you start your own company, especially in the software space. So uh, for me, it was a lot of lessons that uh, we we put into practice um, on a daily basis. And it's something that I ask the whole uh, team to read as well. And then there are a bunch of books on uh, different, you know, specific uh, how to build products in the software space or also like e-commerce um, overall i read a lot of like business books to be honest but the lean startup is probably that some book that everyone working in this space uh, tech or the sales world should read at least once in their life got it got it uh, we will we'll put that in the show notes and you know if you could go back in time when you started working on shop circle what is the one thing you would have focused on or done anything differently um yeah so um, what, what, sorry say that uh, say, ask uh, again the question please Rohit. yeah no absolutely so you know if you could go back in time when you started working on shop circle what is the one thing you would have focused on or done thing differently so yeah things that i would have done different um i think like uh, look, to be honest um maybe like we stay in stealth mode for a very long time uh maybe like looking back in the past we should have like uh go out of stealth relatively uh sooner I mean, it's good to build in silence, uh, to be very honest, because you don't get too much distraction and team is pretty focused on this mission. But at the same time, uh, it's also good for your clients to get to know your products earlier on. So mixed feeling about uh, stealth or not stealth. I think it's good as long as you, you know, don't keep it for too long. And then uh, what else is, uh, yeah, the other point is be aggressive, uh, but like, uh, not too much, right? I mean, it's very easy for PC investors to tell you to be aggressive when everything is fine. And you might remember in the uh, beginning of 2022, after COVID, there were a lot of money coming into the industry, both e-commerce and software overall. And that that narrative changed very fast, right? In the second half of 2022, beginning of 2023, people were saying, okay, you should burn less, you should invest less. So always be cautious. Um, it's you're doing something that is very risky anyway starting a tech business but it's important for you over the long term that you know in order to be a good business over the long term you should be able to generate cash flow um and in order to do that you should always like keep an eye on the cost right you should not think about growing revenue uh, at all costs and then think about profitability in year 10 15. so uh always better to be uh, safe uh then then sorry especially when the market turns so you should find the right combination of being aggressive but at the same time without doing too much and usually like you know keeping a couple of years of runway is always like a good approach and then start raising especially when the market is like this when you are far away from going uh out of business because of cash right so i usually recommend funders to start a fundraising process between 10 and 14 months runway so yeah these are the two biggest lessons that i learned and things that i would have done a bit differently going back got awesome and, and do you have any favorite online tools example gmail slack zoom yeah i mean like all the, our communication uh goes through slack so uh slack is an unbelievable product i think 
I used to have different shots when I was in the corporates or in banking. It's like, it's just like 10 times uh, better. I was also like, you know, uh, an equity uh, investor personally, because I used to love the product. Um, and then, um, yeah, but it's also like a Salesforce company and Salesforce overall is a great tool to do all our CRM um, through Salesforce. Um, and then um, I know that this is a bit controversial, but I love um, the Gmail suite. Um, so, you know, Google Meet, um, Calendar, all the integration that you can have across, um, if, you know, the email um, automation as well. So yeah, these three are part of my uh, daily tech suite. There is much more, um, but yeah, these three are things that I use on a daily basis multiple times. Got it. And absolutely, we'll put that in the show notes. And look at what is the best way people can reach out to you and know more about um, the shopping. Yeah, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, people can uh, reach me out there. Um, or like we have an info shop or call email uh, on our website where uh, people can ask questions about products, about joining Shop Circle. Um, so yeah, either the main website, uh, which is um, shopcircle.co, or me personally on LinkedIn. No, absolutely, we'll put that in, uh, 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 in, in, the, in the notes. Uh, thank you so much for taking our time and speaking to us. Uh, Luca, I really enjoyed my conversation with you. Thanks a lot, Roy. Then uh, keep going. It's a great example of uh, entrepreneurship. I think and you had amazing guests. Glad to be here. Oh, excellent. Thank you.